All right, so we are so uh, uh, happy to have um, with us today for our colloquium, Laura Waller. And I'm gonna do the introduction real fast and then Laura will take it away. Uh, so Laura is the Ten Va Ted Van Duzer Endowed Assistant Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at UC Berkeley. She's a senior fellow at the Berkeley Institute of Data Science with affiliations in bioengineering and applied science and technology. Previously, Laura was a postdoctoral researcher and lecturer of physics at Princeton University from 2010 to 2012 and received her bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees in the electrical engineering computer science department from MIT in 2004, 2005, and 2010, respectively. Laura is a recipient of the Moore Foundation uh, Data-Driven Investigator Award, Baker Fellowship, SPIE Early Career Award, the Carol D. Sock Distinguished Graduate Mentoring Award, NSF Career Award, and Packard Fellowship for Science and Engineering. And we are so happy to have you here today. Thank you so much for uh, giving us this talk and we are super excited to hear it. Thanks. All right. Should be able to see my screen now. Yep. Um, and as we just discussed, feel free to interrupt with questions or clarifications as we go. Uh, I don't monitor the Q&A very well, but somebody can interrupt me if there's questions. Perfect. Okay, so I want to talk about uh, my group's research in computational microscopy. This is all within the realm of computational imaging, which is a relatively emerging area of research. It's been around for a couple of decades. Uh, formally, but it's these ideas have been around for a while. And it's really uh, a concept about how you should design imaging systems in terms of both the hardware and software by, uh, by doing holistic design of treating these things together as like the hardware can do different things, the software can do different things. And uh, in computational imaging, for example, you often take, you design your hardware to take measurements that are not your final image, but rather some intermediate uh, measurement that can then be solved, uh, can be put into a solver to recover your image after the fact, um, in this reconstruction piece. And it's really the heart of this is going back and forth iteratively designing things to, to uh, take advantage of what's best done by hardware versus software. I'm going to get a little bit into this sort of new thread in computational imaging, which I call data-driven design which is really about not just using optimization to reconstruct the image as best possible from the measured data, but using like optimization and machine learning to design the best hardware um, or the best capture mechanisms so that you can, in conjunction with your reconstruction algorithm, get your best results. Okay, so here's my like canonical example that's gonna be a lot of what I talk about in this talk. And it's this lensless imaging problem. So I just take a camera and I remove the lens and I point the sensor at the world and take a picture. This picture looks like garbage because there was no lens there to form the image, right? But uh, the light that hit the sensor is the same light that would have hit the sensor if I had the lens there. And the lens's only job was to bend the light rays in a particular way. So uh, given all of the computational power we have these days, if I could computationally bend those light rays, I could take this measurement and reconstruct the image from it, right? So in practice, you can't really do this um, because you don't have enough information. It's too ill-posed of a problem. So I'm gonna talk about a project today. We call it Diffuser Cam, and there's a lot of variations on it. But basically what we do is we stick a, a different optical element in there. So this is not a lens. It's much closer to the sensor. It's just sitting on top of the sensor. And it's really just a, a, a scattering element, we call a diffuser. Um, basically what we use is equivalent to, and sometimes we do just use these stickers that you put on your window so your neighbors cannot see in. So you put some privacy glass sticker on your sensor and take a picture that also looks like garbage, but now it's structured garbage in a particular way. And from this image, we can reconstruct our scene computationally. Um, so I wanna talk about how we get there. And I have to first draw this contrast to traditional imaging systems. So a regular camera has a lens and the lens's job is to take a point in the scene and form an image of it on the sensor. So your point spread function or your impulse response function of the system is ideally just a delta function. Um, you can never quite get there because of diffraction limit. 
but um, that's the goal. And uh, lensless cameras have a totally different goal. Uh, now, when you put a point in your scene, it's just spreading light all out, and then you put some mask like this diffuser, maybe an amplitude mask, in front of the sensor, and your impulse response or point spread function of your system is now some weird coded pattern. Um, this is a case of an amplitude pattern that was carefully designed. Um, our diffuser cam is a phase pattern because it's a phase diffuser uh, that is not designed at all. It's just sort of opportunistic imaging. Uh, in fact, we had two awesome undergrads in the group who did a class project where they built all of this on a Raspberry Pi sensor because it's cheap and they use double-sided scotch tape as their diffuser um, and reconstruct some images. And then they made a hardware software tutorial that you can find here um, for teaching people how to build this at home. You can do this like on the weekend with your kids if you like. And if you get it working, send us images. So this is a terrible sensor, terrible diffuser. Um, your images will be terrible, but it's great if you can get anything out of it. It's really for fun. Um, but I want to talk about like where we're going in directions of like science. Um, so I actually argue that this sort of El Chipo version is pretty useful for educational things. Uh, there's a couple of classes that are using this as their class project at CMU and Caltech, I know. Um, they got it to replicate it. It's a linear system, so it's great for a signal processing class. Um, but if you think about this diffuser cam, I need to explain its basic operation. So a point maps to this caustic pattern. It looks like the bottom of a swimming pool on a hot day. It's the exact same idea. You have like a random, smooth, bumpy surface that's randomly focusing light in different places. If I move that point source, what happens? Well, this caustic pattern just shifts. So um, it's basically a pure shift. This is a shift invariant system. And that's because the diffuser is very smooth. It obeys the proxial approximation for relatively small angles like what you would have in photography. If I, oh, this is really annoying. I can never seem to turn this one off. If I turn on two point sources, then what I get is uh, the linear sum of the responses for each one. So this is linear in intensity. And uh, you can write this then as a, a linear matrix equation. So our measurement Y is this thing that I measured. Um, and uh, I'm trying to reconstruct this scene. So traditional camera, you want your forward model or this like uh, forward matrix A to be as close as possible to the identity matrix. Uh, with these computational cameras, you don't care about that. All you want is that A is invertible and known. And so if you think about your scene, um, how it maps into your measurements, well, every measurement, every pixel of measurement is some weird linear combination of, of the uh, original scene points. And so we call this multiplexing because a point in the scene maps to uh, a measurement that's spread across a lot of pixels. And that, that makes this A matrix uh, maybe full rank. So, um, you can see now that it's a linear system that we can we can solve this inverse problem if the A is invertible, but also known. I need to know it, right? And so we want to make this kind of thing something that you can build at home with, with your kids on the weekend. And so uh, how do you know this A matrix? So if you were to, if you knew the surface shape of the diffuser, you could certainly know this A matrix. Um, but then what, do I need you to go use an AFM? Then you can't do this at home. Um, you could go measure it. So you could go into your scene and make your scene all black except for one point source. You can use your iPhone flashlight for this and just move it around the scene uh, and measure the response at every position within the scene. And that would be basically mapping out these different columns of the A matrix. The problem with that is that uh, we usually use, say, a one megapixel sensor that's even on the low end. So X is a million elements, meaning that A is a million elements squared, a million squared elements. And so you have to take a million calibration measurements. You need to precisely move that point source around the scene. And then you have this million squared matrix that you need to invert. And this is all possible, but extremely impractical. You're just, you're not going to do this for fun, right? Um, so we wanted to get around that. And what we're going to do, we could machine learn the whole thing. So we could dump in input output pairs. And I'll show you that we did try that. Um, that also has the problems of just building this, this training setup to build up this training data set. Um, so we're going to do something that's a little bit of a hybrid between these. 
uh, and try to exploit some of the physics that we know to make the computation easier. And by that, I really mean this, uh, this shifting property. So as that point source shifts around the scene, um, this, uh, this measurement or point spread function simply shifts. And because it's a simple shift, I don't need to calibrate every position, right? So I can just calibrate one on axis point spread function and I know all of the rest because they're just shifted versions of the original. So now you can actually see why we have this, this black aperture around here. It's just a piece of tape. We just put that on to limit the size of this point spread function so that when it shifts, we're not picking up new information that wasn't in the calibration. And that is like purely for making everything easy. You're losing a bit of light, but it makes a lot of things easier. So we just uh, do that. Um, this pattern does shift off the edge of the sensor. So there's also a cropping that goes into this forward model that I'm not showing you because it just makes it more complicated. So for simplicity, I'm gonna ignore it, but it's quite easy to put into the, the final algorithm. But the beauty is that this A matrix now is a convolution matrix. So every column is the same, it's just a shifted version of the previous one. And so there's no need to measure every column here. You can just measure one response function with one uh, point source, like your iPhone flashlight. And there's no need to store this giant matrix either because it's just a convolution matrix. And so we can do a deconvolution as our inverse problem. And if you do that in Fourier space, um, you don't have to ever store or in, like you don't even instantiate this A matrix. You just do a, a Fourier space uh, deconvolution. So it's computationally very efficient. You can see some of these point spread functions. Really, they're just shifted versions. So I'm showing the matrix as if this was all a 1D problem. But of course, it's 2D and you have to consider raster scanning and blocks of this A matrix. OK, so here's some raw data that we capture and then the reconstructed image from it. And in this case, we're solving this deconvolution problem with ADMM, uh, just an optimization solver that's really popular, and total variation regularization. So we don't really need this, but it's useful for denoising. Uh, we do it all in Halide. Halide is a, um, a programming language that's uh, really nice for using your, your hardware, like it, for whatever GPU you have, it uses it very efficiently to compute fast without you having to be an expert in GPU computing. Here's a nicer picture of me and then a video. Um, so this video I like to show, hopefully it comes across over Zoom, um, but I like to show it because it has some artifacts in it, right? Like you can see some weird things happening. And these highlight some of the issues with lensless cameras that um, they are great because they're so small and cheap. So they're really compact, they're very cheap, um, but they're really not gonna replace your iPhone cameras anytime soon because uh, your cell phone cameras are already very small and cheap. So these could be smaller, but you can see we don't have perfect image quality. It's sort of not competing with the fancy, uh, the fancy photographs you get out of your, your camera phones these days. I might argue that we just started this and, and people have been working on those cameras for decades with a lot of manpower. And so with a lot of work, I think that the quality of the images coming out of these cameras could improve a lot. And uh, uh, almost surely that the artifacts are from model mismatch from that, that piece of tape melting a little bit or bending or warping uh, between the calibration and the reconstruction. Um, also our reconstruction methods are imperfect. So there's a lot of room to grow in terms of quality, but that's not the direction we're gonna take with these cameras. So let me explain the Emerson problem a little bit. Um, it's basically uh, an optimization problem. We're trying to minimize the difference between the measurement, the, the image that we took, and the expected measurement. So AX is taking your current estimate of the scene and running it through your forward model, basically convolving it with that point spread function. And then you try to minimize uh, the difference between that and the actual measurement. So this is our data fidelity term. We enforce a uh, positivity constraint, meaning that we're enforcing that the scene has all positive intensities, which makes sense because there's no such thing as negative light. Um, uh, and then this last term uh, is enforcing some sort of sparsity. So in this case, it's total variation. We can control how much with our like regularization parameter here. So it's basically doing denoising right now. But later I'll show you how we're going to try to solve for higher dimensional um, objects and then this this sparsity enforcement becomes absolutely critical. So I call this the the physics-based or model-based reconstruction method. We're putting uh, 
we're putting our measurement into an optimization inverse solver that uh, that uses the known physics of the system by by like knowing this A matrix. So um, knowing the A matrix is really important to this solver. That's why we call it the physics-based solver because we're using the physics we know to solve this optimization problem. The deep learning way of doing this would be to forget the physics and just feed a whole bunch of input-output pairs and let the this let some deep neural network learn the physics itself and figure out the input-output relationships. Um, so there's a lot of pros and cons to these two different ways of doing it. I would say this physics-based stuff is sort of traditional computational imaging and deep learning is becoming really popular, but there's also a lot of known issues with it that it's not always better. Um, and some of the pros and cons that we see are that deep learning can be really fast reconstructions. That's one of its big advantages. Uh, but these training data sets are really hard to capture on sort of one-off imaging systems like ours. And there's not a lot of interpretability there. So uh, what we wanted to do was something that's a little bit best of both worlds. We call this physics-based learning. Um, and the idea is to try to use the physics that we know and learn the stuff that we don't know. And uh, the using the physics that we know amounts to designing uh, deep neural networks whose architecture is, is like defined by the physics of the problem such that the architecture will be really efficient. And that buys you um, being able to use a lot less training data. You can use shallower networks than you would have otherwise. And it tends to work better and, and be like more predictable. So we do this by doing uh, unrolled networks. Um, we didn't invent these. They've been around for a little while. We're just using them for this problem. Um, and the unrolled physics-based networks basically means you take that, that model-based algorithm that's an iterative optimization and you make a neural network where each layer of the neural network is one iteration of your optimization problem. So you set it up so that uh, the first layer is the first iteration, second layer is second iteration. Typically we need dozens of iterations, so we'll have dozens of layers here and you've got some loss function here. But now I can learn the, all the hyperparameters of that optimization algorithm and whatever else I want to. So I can put a unit at the end or I can learn more, more things. For example, we often say that uh, we know that forward matrix A, but we, we didn't calibrate it, so we might there might be some parameters that we don't know about A that we can that we can put into this learning function. So I just want to show you uh, that this is useful. We start with a ground truth image and if I use this physics based or model based iterative optimization, I get some weird artifacts and it's really slow. So a big advantage of the deep learning based method is that once you've gone through all the trouble of training it, the reconstructions are very fast. And this is really useful for these kinds of cameras um, in that you can get good quality images in real time. You can sort of see the result of your camera in real time, which is really valuable, but it has other artifacts. And so when I combine the two, and we sort of like played around with the spectrum in this paper, we, we looked at different, learning different amounts of stuff. And this was sort of like the best case scenario where we're getting pretty fast and we've got less artifacts than either the, the fully deep learned or fully iterative algorithms. Any questions? All right, so um, this was all about um, using machine learning or optimization to optimize the inverse problem, like the reconstruction algorithm. This has been pretty popular in computational imaging. Um, learning priors is another big one. Uh, but what we wanted to do is take this a step further, and we were doing this in a few other projects in the group, is to try to optimize the hardware. Um, so not just optimize the reconstruction, from whatever images you happen to capture, but let's optimize that um, diffuser phase mask and try to figure out what's the, the perfect surface shape of the diffuser to get to give me the easiest to solve inverse problem. Um, so uh, one of my new students, Eric, is working on this, and this is really hard to 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 solve because you're, it's such a humongous non-convex nonlinear optimization. So he's using his end-to-end -end learning approaches. Um, and we parameterize the surface here, but what it comes out to is basically what you want on the diffuser surface is a bunch of lenslets, and they're gonna change shape and size and position depending on, on what types of samples you're trying to image. So you do need to put that in. Uh, but you can see as he's optimizing, we're getting better 3D reconstructions here for a 3D case. 
Okay, so I mentioned 3D. I want to explain how we do this. So this is really, I think, a power of, of lensless imagers that uh, you can make your cameras small and cheap, but I think where these things are going to be useful is where they can do something that a regular camera cannot do. And a regular camera can't do 3D. If something is out of focus, it's just blurred and you cannot get that information back, it's gone. Whereas with a lensless camera, there is no focus plane. And so there is no such thing as out of focus. It's just off the plane that you calibrated at. And so what happens when you move off the plane you calibrated at? Here's just an animation as I move a point source axially. And what you see here is it still shows this caustic pattern. And all that's happening is the caustic pattern is changing its size. It's just rescaling depending on depth. So this is really cool because now I have a system that gives a different response for every lateral position because that, uh, that caustic pattern shifts and a different response for every axial position because the caustic pattern scales. And so I have a unique response of the system to every point in 3D, um, which is good. I have a chance to solve for 3D. Uh, and I can predict the response of the system from a single calibration measurement, just a single on-axis point spread function. OK, so what we're going to use this for is to solve for 3D. But we want to take a 2D measurement and solve for 3D information. So uh, we're trying to solve for a lot more things than we measured. So we need to get into compressed sensing. And if you think about compressive imaging, uh, if we take an image uh, and we want to compress it, we're usually trying to take some image and represent everything about the image without loss of information, but with less data. And this is almost always done in post-processing, right? So uh, what we want to do with compressed sensing is to compress the data in the capture stage. And this has been a really uh, popular topic in computational imaging. I think it's a place where it can really find uh, great use. So let's set up this 3D problem. Now say I want to solve for, say I want to solve for 100 different depth planes. I have a one megapixel sensor. So now I'm trying to solve for 100 million things, basically 100 million voxels in my 3D scene. I still want to just take a single 2D image. So I'm still just taking a million measurements. So I'm 100x underdetermined. Um, so we already know that because of the um, the shift invariance property of, of this microscope and the scaling with depth, then this A matrix I can fully predict from a single calibration measurement, which is great because now it's 1 million by 100 million in size. This is, would be insane to capture, um, to, to like physically capture all of this information. So we saved the calibration and computation problems, but this is still very highly underdetermined problem. And so to go after the underdeterminedness of this, we're gonna use compressed sensing. Um, how many people have know about compressed sensing? Like, you've heard of it before. Put a the thumbs up or a clapping. I guess I can't see all of the attendees. That's all right. Okay, so compressed sensing. There was sensing. one hand that was raised. If that helps. Okay. <laughs> so lots of people don't know, or they're not paying attention anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so compressed sensing is all about solving underdetermined problems, and the beauty of it is that you can provably solve underdetermined problems uniquely if you meet the criteria for compressed sensing. And the criteria are that you have to have a sparse sample in some domain, meaning that your image should be representable with fewer coefficients than you have pixels. Um, and this is generally true of natural scenes. Uh, the other requirement is multiplexing that. A point in the scene mapping to a lot of pixels on the sensor is very good because then when I start deleting pixels on the sensor, I still have information about the entire scene. So because in my raw image, uh, every point in the scene maps to a lot of different pixels on the raw image, then when I go throwing away a whole bunch of the, the raw data, I still have information about the whole scene. So um, here I've thrown away 80% of the, the pixels in the raw image, and I'm still getting a decent reconstruction. I can throw away 90%, even 98% of the pixels gone still gives me a rough, a, a rough image of what the scene looked like. And that's all because there's still information there in the pixels that weren't deleted. And this is very different than a one-to-one -one imaging camera, where when you delete the pixels, the information is just gone. OK, so uh, in the 3D case, we actually really need this uh, because we're not going to throw away pixels, but rather use the, pixel, the 2D pixels we have to reconstruct a three-dimensional scene. So we take this 
um, single 2D measurement and we can reconstruct the 3D scene. This is just a, a, a spinning visualization of the 3D reconstruction to show you that we could get good depth information. And here we were solving for 128 different depth planes um, from the single 2D image at the full lateral resolution of the original image. Okay, I think this is really cool for microscopy. And that's because a lot of people are doing 3D microscopy. They want to look at live samples, live cells. And so um, when you're doing that, you always have this trade-off between, I'm calling this space now in the project, it's really the, the number of voxels that I measure. So if I want to measure a large area with high resolution, then I'm trying to measure a lot of voxels. And so, for example, if you use any of these um, point scanning microscopy methods, then you just need to take more time. So the number of voxels you need might linearly scale with the, the amount of time you need to take them because you're measuring only one point at a time. Or if you're measuring a, a plane at a time, then you're usually sacrificing resolution for speed. Um, light field microscopy is a nice example of, it's a single shot method that gets single shot 3D information, but at the cost of a drastic drop in resolution. So it's usually a factor of 10 or so, which is a huge problem for microscopy because the only reason you use a microscope is to get higher resolution. So people just aren't willing to give up all of that resolution. This um, diffuser cam concept I've talked about, because it uses compressed sensing, it sort of has this range that it's always fast speed because it's always single shot. But how, much, how many voxels you can faithfully represent depends on the sparsity of the scene. Um, not on your sort of hardware collection. So you have a chance to have this best of both worlds case where if your sample is very sparse, you can collect um, a large number of voxels fast. And I think this is really promising because as things scale up, sort of like the bigger, more large scale imaging you want to do, um, the more valuable it is to have this, um, this scaling with sparsity rather than uh, space bound with product. So one of the big application spaces that we've been working on, and this is quite old now, is uh, in collaboration with Hillel Adesnik's lab, looking at uh, neurons as they fire. So optogenetics and it's all, all those related tools mean that when a neuron fires, it lights up. And this is happening on millisecond time scales, so we need very fast measurements, and it's happening in 3D. So we need to measure this, like we need to measure on millisecond time scales in 3D what's happening, which neurons are on at what time. And uh, of course, neuroscientists always wanna look at that across the biggest volume possible because they're trying to look at how neurons are related to each other. And neurons could be connected across the entire brain. So you need this um, like big area, you need good resolution because you need single neuron resolution. And so that's what we're trying to do here. This is a zebra fish. We put a, this is a slightly different microscope, but it, it's a similar approach. But we can get this map of the 3D positions of every neuron. And then the video is showing you over time um, the activity of each neuron at that particular time. So our real goal is to build a whole bunch of these and tile them across a mouse's brain because they're very easy to tile and they're really compact and lightweight. So the mice can run around with them on their head. And I'll just show you sort of our first approximation at that. This is the uh, diffuser cam microscope version. So we put the sample a lot closer, it brings all kinds of new problems, um, but then we can, we can image neural activity in this zebra fish um, at very fast speeds. Okay, so I'm gonna get a little bit into the details of our design. And originally I told you we were using this privacy glass filter, like um, a diffuser that's just off the shelf. Uh, basically, you can think of the surface shape as being like Gaussian random bumps. And so it creates these point spread functions that look like caustics. And this is a smooth diffuser. So these caustics are relatively smooth. There's a lot of background. So there's a lot of like light in between the sharp focus spots. And that's bad because that's, um, that's basically creating sort of like a background and reducing the dynamic range, making the problem more ill-posed and hurting your SNR basically. So if you want really good SNR, the best thing you can do is use a lens and just image this. This gives you great SNR because all of your light is piled up into one point, but it completely invalidates your ability to do compressed sensing. And so you lose the 3D, all of the 3D capabilities. And so what you might think of using is a micro lens array. So use a series of small lenses so that you get this good focusing power. It's good for SNR. 
you've got like actually dark spaces in between these bright bright spots. Um, the problem with this is that then as I shift my uh, point source, that point spread function, which is now a grid, shifts. And if I shift it by the right amount, then the grid shifts by exactly one period. And now the point spread function is essentially the same as the one. So for these two point positions, they have almost exactly the same system response. So this is a very hard to, very difficult ambiguity to solve in your inverse problem. So what we actually end up using that ends up being basically a sort of best, best sort of compromise between all of these worlds is randomly spaced microlenses. So they don't have this grid effect that has these ambiguities um, when you shift by the appropriate amount, um, but they do have this effect of concentrating light into different spots. And then when we're doing 3D, we can assign each of these microlenses to have a different focal length so that we have a sharp focus spot at all of the different depths we care about. So if you have a range of depths that you want to image, you should have a microlens that focuses at that depth so that you have sharp high spatial frequencies in the point spread functions for each depth. You don't want the point spread function getting blurry because that's going to reduce your resolution at that depth. So uh, we've actually started putting these in regular microscopes, not the lensless ones. Um, there's a lot of reasons to do that, and primarily that the objective gives you some magnification, but it also buys you back um, this shift variant. This shift invariant property becomes uh, a much better approximation when you put this phase mask or diffuser in the back focal plane of, of a microscope objective. So this is not a regular microscope because there's no tube lens here, it's just the objective lens. This phase mac is in the back focal plane and then a, a few millimeters later is the sensor. This is a little bit not to scale. But now my point spread function has some random spots and as I go through different depths, different spots come into focus. The whole thing is also uh, scaling, uh, but that can all be accounted for. So you take a video that looks something like this and then you can reconstruct uh, a 3D video. So I'm trying to show you the 3D information of the C. elegans worm, and then you can see it moving around a little bit at the end. So we have time and three-dimensional space in our reconstruction. The real uh, design beauty of this is that we get pretty uniform resolution across a big volume. And we're gonna compare against what we call Fourier diffuser scope, sorry, Fourier light field microscope. So the light field microscope is the the array of small micro lenses. If you put that in the Fourier space, you can prove that you can actually get better performance out of the microscope in terms of 3D. So we're gonna compare against that. But if you've heard of light field microscope, um, this, is, this is better than the light field microscope. So we're gonna compare against that to be fair. And what you see is uh, sort of exactly what we designed for is that at some uh, depth plane, sort of like right near the focus plane, uh, we do a little bit worse in terms of resolution but we get that good resolution across a much larger area. So if you're trying to do 3D imaging, this makes sense. You want good resolution across a big area, even if it costs you a little bit of, of your maximum resolution at the, at the best, best case scenario. That's true for the lateral and the axial resolution. And this is actually a pretty impressive volume uh, that we're able to get single neuron resolution across. So here's our one of our microscope setups, and we were going for less than five microns resolution. So we achieved this less than five microns resolution across a couple hundred microns of depth. Um, and that was the design goal there for axial and lateral. We're trying to distinguish individual neurons here. Um, we have another version of this built on the miniscope for, uh, so the miniscope is a super popular neuroscience tool. It's a 3D printed open source microscope that's smaller than a quarter, weighs, you know, grams. And uh, you can head mount this on uh, a mouse that's running around. So you can like put it in a maze and watch which neurons fire when it turns left or something like that. Um, and these are really popular in neuroscience. And so we wanted to take advantage of the open source aspect of this to get people to use our technology. So we built what we call Miniscope 3D. And it's, we took the Miniscope, we removed the tube lens, we shoved our diffuser or phase mask into the, the back aperture. So the objective in this case is a grin lens and the back aperture is right here. And then because we got rid of the tube lens and we don't need much distance between the phase mask and the sensor, we made everything smaller. So this thing is uh, almost half the size of the original and it weighs only two and a half grams. It's lighter weight and smaller. 
and it gives you 3D information instead of 2D. So we're hoping that this is going to get adopted by this community. Here's a picture of the physical device. So this is a quarter. This thing is really tiny. And this is the grin lens here that you, you can surgically implant that into the mouse's brain and watch it run around. Um, so here's what our phase mask looks like. It's the random micro lenses that I showed you before. Um, and then we get a couple microns resolution, which was the design here. So a couple microns of resolution across uh, hundreds of microns squared volume. And here's just a video from this Miniscope 3D and then the reconstructed image. These are um, tardigrades or little water bears. They're like cute little water caterpillars. And you can see we're getting good 3D information. You can see its little legs as it's crawling around. And we get not isotropic resolution, but pretty good resolution in the axial dimension as well as lateral. Okay, so um, I showed you how I can take a 2D measurement and reconstruct a 2D image, or I can take a 2D measurement and reconstruct a 3D image. But this XYZ as our three dimensions isn't sort of set in stone. And I wanna show two other projects where we reconstruct three dimensional quantities that are different. So the first one is not XYZ, but XY time. Okay, so what am I talking about? So now we're gonna reconstruct a super resolution time in two lateral dimensions. And this is all based on this principle of multiplexing. So a regular lensed camera um, has in front of a sensor that is a rolling shutter sensor now. Uh, why is this not replaying? So as the, the rolling shutter goes down and measures different parts of the scene, the scene might be changing, right? Sorry, my animation's messed up. So, okay, so different things are gonna light up at different times. And because it's a rolling shutter sensor, you're only gonna measure that information if it happens to, if it happens to like have that source on during the time that you're at the correct uh, vertical position for that point source. So you're gonna miss information in time if you've got stuff happening faster than the frame rate of the sensor. So you've got the frame rate of the sensor, which is how long it takes to do a, a full sweep. And then you've got the line scan rate, which is how long it takes to go from one line to the next, right? So when you have a multiplex system like these lensless cameras, then every point in the scene sends information to every pixel on the sensor. So then when you measure just a line on the sensor, it actually contains information about the entire 2D scene, right? And so then when you have these things, uh, say you have like, this blue light flashing and then the purple light and then the yellow light over the course of a single exposure while the rolling shutter is flying down you still get information about each of those events and basically like what time they happen depends on what which line they get measured by and then we have to figure out if we can reconstruct the entire 2d scene from this so if you just take uh your raw data like this single frame of from the rolling shutter and pretend like nothing was moving, it was a static scene and reconstruct it, and you get motion blurs. This is a tennis ball hitting a, a textbook. But if we do this space-time compressed sensing reconstruction, we can actually reconstruct this video um, at the frame. So the videos, the, the frame rate of the video corresponds to the line scan rate of the rolling shutter sensor. So how long it takes to go from one line to the next is each, each frame in our reconstruction. And this is uh, usually about a thousand times faster than the actual frame rate of the sensor, which is really cool. You can take a cheap sensor and make it a, an ultra fast sensor. Here's another important scientific application of Nerf darts hitting apples. Um, and so uh, I think this is a really cool project. I'm, I don't really wanna get into the caveats, but you need a lot of light to make this work because you're really like, trying to reconstruct a lot of stuff from very little measurement. Um, so it, it's, uh, you have to think about where it's useful. But then the last one I wanna talk about briefly is um, hyperspectral. So now instead of XYZ or XY time, I'm gonna re reconstruct XY wavelength. Okay, so Christina and my group came up with this idea and has done all of the work on it. But basically what she did was she took our original diffuser cam with this Gaussian uh, smooth diffuser. And all she did was that instead of putting a normal monochromatic 2D sensor behind it, she, she glued a spectral filter array onto the sensor. 
And this spectral filter array comes from uh, Viavi Solutions as a company. They offered it to us for free and uh, we were excited to try it. But basically it's, uh, it's an array of, of super pixels. I'm gonna call this a super pixel. And each super pixel has eight by eight uh, narrow line width filters in it. So it's, it measures 64 different color channels. So normally you put a bare filter camera on to measure RGB three color channels. Here we're gonna measure 64 color channels. This is what hyperspectral is all about, getting spatial information and then spectral, high resolution spectral information. So we have 64 different color channels available. Um, and so uh, what does this have to do with our diffuser cam is that in a normal situation, what you would do is you would use a very low resolution lens and you would say like this super pixel is basically my spatial resolution. So I can resolve 64 colors across this pixel, 64 colors across this pixel, but basically I'm directly sacrificing lateral resolution for spectral in that case. And I wanna show you how our diffuser cam with compressed sensing can avoid that trade-off and get you to back to like sub super pixel res spatial resolution uh, with this full 64 color channels. So we take the coded measurement and basically we just do the same thing as with the 3D case. We're solving for some 3D thing. Now it's just a different set of dimensions and we're enforcing sparsity. That's the compressed sensing part. And this is uh, for hyperspectral, this is particularly, particularly useful because um, usually you're looking at some scene with different, uh, different materials and each material will have a different spectrum, but you can assume that, that you're gonna have some sparse set of spectra. And so then you can actually solve this. We can get about a quarter of the super pixel resolution. So we can't get back to one pixel uh, full resolution, but uh, we also had a lot of hardware problems with this particular setup. Uh, and so we can reconstruct this, this hyperspectral data cube with kind of spatial super resolution in the sense that it's better than the super pixel. But I'm kind of excited about this because these uh, sensor arrays are dirt cheap. Like they can be mass manufactured and, and we're just gluing it on the sensor and calibrating afterwards. So they're quite easy to build, um, but you can make a hyperspectral camera now that's extremely compact, doesn't really sacrifice your spa spatial resolution. So you can still get a nice 2D image. Um, and one of the really cool things is that uh, this company that makes these filter arrays can flexibly choose any spectral filters you want. And so you could design this whole thing to be like, particularly uh, good at measuring certain classification problems that people do with hyperspectral cameras. For example, they're used to find bruises in apples without cutting the apple open or something like this, or for agriculture. Um, you could tune these spectral filters choices to be exactly what you need for a particular um, classification problem or task-based imaging problem. Okay, um, this is coming to the end of my talk. I'm keeping it short. I know everyone's sick of Zoom, but I'm happy to have lots of discussion afterwards. Uh, I think there's a lot of promise for computational imaging. This is just one particular hardware platform that we've been working on in my lab. Uh, there's a lot of different uh, there's a lot of different application spaces that we can potentially approach, and there's a lot of different hardware configurations that can be useful. I hope you've gotten from this uh, talk a, a big theme of my lab is making things that are reproducible. And when we're doing computational imaging, reproducible doesn't just mean putting my code on GitHub and making it open source, but actually making my hardware uh, open source. And that doesn't just mean giving you instructions for building the hardware. It means designing so that these things can be built with cheap, easily accessible hardware. And all of it can be put together and uh, made to work in a functioning way by a non-expert. That's really our goal in all of our projects. This is a, a, just an image of an LED array. This is another project that we work on that has really similar themes to it. But I, I'm really excited when people try the stuff that we've been doing and we're more than happy to help if you have applications or just wanna try things for fun. So thanks very much to my group who did this actual work and I'll be very happy to take any questions. Awesome, wow, what a, what a really cool talk, that was so awesome. Um, so we do have a, a few questions actually, uh, and I didn't want to interrupt because uh, we had kind of moved past, but uh, they came at the end there, so it was it's not not too much of a wait. Um, so I'm just going to go 
down in order here. So um, David Schmidt says, how do the ideas of diffuser cam scale for bit depth? Does it still scale from the camera or can you computationally make higher bit depth images from a single 2D image? Yeah, so this is a great question. I don't have a good answer to this because it's really complicated. So let me find, I think I just hit it. Um, yeah, so I, I think this is really related to SNR, right? So um, the you can argue that our SNR is gonna be worse than a normal camera, right? Because we're spreading the light out and so we're gonna get hit by Poisson noise worse. Uh, but you can also argue that because we're spreading the light out, we're not going to hit saturation as quickly. And so you could potentially do some like high dynamic range imaging with this. Um, I think it's hurting you more than it's helping you, but uh, it's just like, it's complicated, I think. Um, so I do think that you're losing, but there's probably certain situations in which you can do better um, because you can take a longer exposure or you can use more light. Um, without saturating your camera. Uh, but if you look, so this is the only thing I have concrete data on is talking about the like signal to noise ratio. And so this is looking at like, you can see, can you see my arrow? Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, as I take, a, so more and more noise means less and less photons, then uh, you get a worse and worse reconstruction. And what I'm showing here is we were comparing our 3D mini scope to the 2D mini scope because we wanted a direct comparison. So you you gain um, in terms of getting 3D information. What you lose is SNR, and you can see it here, right? The 2D mini scope has a much better image when you get to really low photon counts. And so if you're dealing with very very low light, then it's gonna we're gonna do worse. Um, I mean, this is a slice out of a 3D reconstruction being compared to a 2D image. So. Um, so there's, that's the trade-off. Uh, one thing that I found was interesting is that we don't lose much in terms of resolution compared to the 2D case. And that's really particular to this mini scope because the 2D mini scope has, terrible, has a terrible objective lens. These miniature microscopes always have highly aberrated objective lenses because it's just not possible to make an objective lens uh, aberration corrected at those tiny scales. So in this case, we've lost very little in terms of resolution. Um, and we definitely lost some in terms of SNR, but we got 3D out of it and we made a smaller device. So that was kind of our argument. That's your trade-off. Um, in a real-world microscope, which is aberration corrected, you're going to lose a lot more spatial resolution. So um, you're giving up spatial resolution for 3D, but it's not a direct trade-off either. So I kind of didn't exactly answer that question, uh, but I don't have a good answer. for yeah, it's, um, it's hard to quantify because the, algor the reconstruction algorithm is nonlinear and non-convex, right? And so it depends on the scene too. So it's very difficult to quantify these things. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, okay, so we have another question from Scott Hunter. What kind of intensity is necessary for the video reconstructions? And I think this may have been around the time when you were doing the rolling shutter and you said that they require more light. Yeah, so for example, you can see like these scenes are clearly like actively illuminated. So we had just like, you know, a photography floodlight, like the lights that you, you get for like a photography studio. They're pretty bright. Like if you look at them, your, your eyes will notice that they're bright. I don't have the numbers on it, but that's sort of like what we needed to get a decent reconstruction here. Um, if you try this in ambient light, I think it'll be, look pretty terrible. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, so we, uh, I'm gonna, we'll come back to you, Jonathan, in just a second. But so Michael Waken has a question that I actually um, am very interested in as well, because I'm interested in the 3D imaging. Um, so he says, thank you so much for the great talk. When you do the 3D spatial reconstruction, do you have to model or take into account the fact that one layer might occlude parts of the object behind it? Yeah, that's a great question. So we assume that it does not occlude the layers behind it. So we're looking at this problem in terms of fluorescent microscopy, where you've got a bunch of fluorescent emitters and nothing is absorbing in that sample. So we're assuming that there is no occlusion. If you have occlusions, it will absolutely break the model. You'll get artifacts from it. And so the way to solve that actually is to, uh, to go to four dimensions, to go to the light field four dimensions. So this project actually originally started with a question I posed to what was then a new grad student who is now starting faculty at UCSD, Nick, and I asked him if he thought he could make a light field 
microscope out of a diffuser instead of a lens light array. And the whole purpose was to be cheap and to be like, uh, you can change the aperture size arbitrarily, which is a big limitation for light field cameras. And uh, so he did that and you can actually solve for the four dimensional light field. But if you make this no occlusions assumption, then you can go directly from the 2D measurement to the 3D intensity distribution. And that gives that like saves you a lot of in terms of computation and it keeps your resolution higher. So we started doing that because in most fluorescence microscopy situations, you don't have occlusions. But if you do have occlusions, you should go back to that light field representation and you solve for a, you take the 2D thing and you solve for a 4D thing, and then you use that 4D thing to solve for 3D uh, with a count of occlusions. Oh, okay. So it's a lot more complicated, but you can do it. Right. Uh, wow, okay. Um, so Jonathan Barlock says, do you have to solve for the A matrix for each axial position when you do 3D diffuser cam? How does solving for this forward model change between 2D and 3D? Um, okay, so in fact, I think when I show yeah, so when I showed this, the, the algorithm, uh, I used, it used to be like the 3D version of it. So I accidentally have th three layers here. I just noticed that when I was giving this talk, but it's exactly the same. So the 3D algorithm, you just put in this, this will be like uh, all the different layers of the 3D stack. And then the A matrix will also have basically a point spread function for each depth. And you can just take the original point spread function, scale it, um, in practice, we often actually measure at a few different depths and then interpolate between them so that we have like the point spread function uh, across 3D. So we might actually measure um, a dozen of them at different depths. Uh, but other than that, you're basically treating it like a, a deconvolution problem where like you're deconvolving each layer independently and then at the end you sum everything up. Oh, very interesting. Um, so Ruben, uh, one of our faculty said, how sensitive is the reconstruction to detector nonlinearities? Uh, detector nonlinearities, I think we do not deal with at all. So it's actually like, so as I mentioned, like uh, saturation won't be an issue. So dynamic range is a little bit weird in these cameras, um, but we're actually like pretty immune to it. This is like a pretty well-known property um, from digital holography, which is kind of similar in, in multiplexing all the information out that you can go to like, you can like really reduce the bit depth and still get good reconstructions. And this is a similar idea that um, these kinds of nonlinearities are, are rather robust. I'm sure that they're creating artifacts that probably we don't care about yet because we have bigger artifacts to worry about. Um, but yeah, we don't worry about that at all. One thing that we do worry about that's really interesting is that, um, in the microscope version of the flat camera, you're up really close to the sensors. Then your light is coming in at very high angles. And then the detectors don't respond uniformly across angle. So they don't actually collect light from past about 30 degrees or so. So in photography and in microscopy, the light coming into the sensor is actually almost collimated. And so nobody cares that these sensors just don't perform at high angles. And so like the flat version of the microscope has big problems with that, that the, the response at different angles is different and needs to be accounted for. And the response is terrible at high angles. And that's a big part of the reason why we did this mini scope version because it gets, just gets away from that problem. And the cost is that it's a slightly larger package device, but it's also a device that people use already. So it, it seemed pretty like advantageous there. Wow, that's really interesting. Um, okay. Are uh, you up for a, a couple more questions? Sure. Fantastic. Um, so we have one from Mark. Uh, are you restricted to the visible spectrum in your imaging technique? Um, so we are because we're using visible spectrum detectors, but you could absolutely do this at different uh, wavelengths. And I know that like there's some like mask based coded aperture imaging in like gamma and x-ray. This isn't too far off from what from that kind of approach. So uh, I haven't seen this particular technique done in those, but similar stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so Dan Rawson says, you were able to get video by reconstructing with assumptions on a rolling shutter speed. Is there any benefit to modulating the scene source light spatially over time? Yeah, totally. That would be really cool. Um, we often talk about, so there's these people who are building a sensor where you can have like 
each pixel can have a coded in time like exposure. Um, and that would be like ideal for what we want to do. Cause so we're doing rolling shutter. So it's just a line scanning straight is definitely not the ideal coding strategy. If you could arbitrarily code in time, that would be awesome. You could do all, you could do much better. I think with this problem. Yeah. Um, okay. So one more from Jonathan, it says, um, it sounds like you're using incoherent light as your source. Is there any benefit to using a coherent source in terms of accurately solving in the forward model? Uh, so n not, ex not really. So one thing that will break down is that, um, the linearity assumption. So if like, we're assuming like fluorophores basically, which are incoherent with each other. So when I turn on two fluorophores, then I just get the linear sum of the intensity from each one. If it, if everything was coherent, if those two points were actually like pinholes in a coherent beam, then uh, you would have to deal with all of the interference and diffraction effects. And uh, that would break this linear and intensity assumption. Um, so you could potentially, you can, so if you do like inline holography, which we're trying to do now, then you can, you can sort of just ignore that. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it changes the system quite a bit. Like you kind of need phase information if you want to do things. Uh, in the same way. Right. So is it, is it, uh, my understanding, is it, is it correct that it's, you're getting in the 3D reconstructions, basically intensity reconstructions, or do you, do you also get the phase at each slice? No, we don't get phase. It's just reconstructing okay. intensity and it's okay. assumed an incoherent object. So every point in the scene is incoherent with every other point. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, cool. Um, looks like that is, it from the Q and A. Um, so I guess let's, uh, we'll, you know, to the extent that we can, we'll thank the speaker one more time. Uh, and thank you so much for this, this, uh, this talk was so good. Um, yeah, we're really, uh, it's just amazing that, that uh, you were able to come and give this talk. So um, I guess that, uh, is it okay, maybe Laura, if you stick around a little bit for a few folks that wanted to chat? Um, yeah, no problem. And then uh, we'll go ahead and just end colloquium for the for the folks that um, need to head out and I will uh, go ahead and stop the recording.